Hello, hello, and hi, 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 and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly show in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, sometimes the future, their group years, their solo years, everything going on in the news. I'm Ken Michaels, and uh, hopefully you're aware of my syndicated Beatles radio talk show called Every Little Thing, airing on some 50 stations at the moment. I also do another talk show podcast on the solo Beatles called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. That's also bi-weekly. And uh, I have my own video channel on YouTube called Ken Michaels Radio, which is loaded with lots of conversations on the fabs. And I'm joined by my regulars here. First of all, a man who's been a part of New York radio for... What was the last count? 40 years? Yes, 40. Yeah. 40 years 40. on Radio's WFUV in New York City. And uh, the the resident Beatles expert there at the station every now and then does uh, Beatles specials of some kind, you know, Beatles Christmas special and whatnot. He's interviewed uh, lots of people in the Beatle world and uh, people like, um, well, uh, James McCartney. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. uh, uh, Julian I interviewed Julian a couple of times. Yep. James McCartney, um, Danny Harrison twice. Right. Uh, with the uh, Fistful of Mercy and Solo, the uh, and Sean Lennon technically, although Sean came as part of a band and didn't really contribute much. But uh, anyway, that's just some of the people and Ringo. Yeah, I was going to say you only you only interview the Beatles kids. That's it. That's what it's ended up. Yeah, that's sort of how, how uh, I kind of I I'd love to interview Mary McCartney though. Okay, I thought you'd want to. <laughs> I thought you'd want to interview Stella. Yeah, sure. Why the heck not? Being the the close but, consultant that you are. Hey, so. how good is that Primrose Hill song? I like it. I think it's yeah. very pretty. Anyway, we're getting into the middle of the show. Introductions. Hi, everyone. Thanks for thanks for watching. Great to see you. Great to see Alan and Ken and. Everyone else out there. And of course, we've got Alan Cozen with us. He is the co-author with Adrian Sinclair of the McCartney Legacy Volume 1. Volume 2, coming your way in December. And also, in the past, the author of um, Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And also, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. And for so many years, a writer for the New York Times in their classical department, and now a freelance writer. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, Darren. Hello, everyone out there. We have uh, a lot of news to get to on the show, but I thought that uh, when we're done with the news, we do need to talk about the newly remastered Let It Be film, which you've all had a chance to see. And in addition to that, uh, there was a Q&A that happened just a few days ago on Zoom with Ringo Starr talking about his current activities even mentioning his Boo Cool Blues album for reasons that are kind of obvious. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, just our comments on the news that's come out about the Mind Games box set, which is due out in July. I just saw July 19th, so it might have been postponed another week. I'm not quite sure. But uh, all the contents, we're aware of what they are and the various configurations of Mind Games. So we'll be talking about those three things, Let It Be, Mind Games, and Ringo's Q&A, following all that's happening in the Beatle news. Of course, Let It Be premiered on Disney Plus on May the 8th, and we'll all be giving our own reviews and our thoughts about it. Um, there was a new video that premiered for the song Let It Be uh, last Friday, as a matter of fact. It opens with Paul at the piano, and during the intro, George is in the background smiling and giving the thumbs up. Uh, lots of different footage used in this video. Lots of nice surprises. Um, I was very pleased with what I saw. For four minutes, it was just pure joy, because <laughs> so much of the stuff we'd never seen before. Um, Alan, what did what were your thoughts about the new video? Yeah, I mean, I like, I like especially the... the beginning of the video where basically you're seeing a lot of alternate takes 
of the same take, you know, alternate camera angles of the same take, which was sort of interesting to me. Um, towards the end of the video, it began to get a little more diffuse, bringing in things that were obviously not part of that performance because, for instance, Paul is singing, but in a shot you're looking at his lips aren't moving or Zelman's talking or, or something like that. But in the beginning, it all seemed to be alternate shots of, of that take that we're listening to. And that was a lot of fun to see. Um, but generally speaking, the, the video as a whole was, you know, it was a, it, it was a nice alternative um, to the sort of standard let it be video that we've been looking at all these years. Yeah. Um agreed darren what were your yeah. thoughts same thing and i guess i should say it here i mean that was the point uh let it be was the point where i think it really started for me as a beatles fan uh i was five and um the 45 the single and then uh and then having the album and going to see the movie in the theater um vague memories because i was five uh, but still memories that took me back to those first days of me being a Beatles fan, you know, now watching everything and hearing everything again, it was, it's, it's, it is bittersweet. Um, and, and wonderful and all the emotions that, that kind of, um, you know, the movie and the video itself. And I was watching the video thinking to myself, well, I know that there's different cuts here because, the, the vocals aren't net, like Alan pointed out, aren't matching lip movement and whatnot. But there's moments where you're actually watching the performance that we've heard now for 54 years. And especially when you watch the film, and we'll talk about that later. And that Watching those performances of them actually recording what we've been listening to all these years. I don't know, there's something really cool and surreal about that. You know, I've been listening to Let It Be since I was five and 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 Heather McCartney, who was around the same age, maybe a couple of years older than me, was sitting in the studio at that moment. Well, you know, it just that type of stuff kind of blows my mind a little, but it's a really nice video, uh, you know, maybe a little redundant because he's used they're using the same stuff that's in the movie. But still, it's like a new way of of experiencing at least that one song. And, and uh, it was very nice. I just found it to be really refreshing because it was so different in watching the video with different footage. And just the fact that you've got a close-up of Billy Preston with his hands on the organ there. Yes. Playing. And uh, there's even a couple of seconds with George Martin with a shaker, you know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, seeing a close-up of John playing the bass notes on the guitar is pretty cool. Um, and seeing George happy <laughs> and smiling and waving to the camera, you know, so it's not, uh, well, we'll talk about it when we discuss yeah. this, but, you know, there, the, there the, are moments. The, the part with George Martin and the shaker, uh, didn't that strike you as being more from um, the, from Dig It? Because in the, in the actual film, he's seen in Dig It with the shaker. Yeah. So, um, and I'm not sure there's shaker on Let It Be, is there? I mean, well, I looked it up online, and there's no mention of George Martin playing anything. On yeah, Let it be. maybe they just wanted to put him in there, but it was that could be why they put yeah. him in there yeah. just to have him. Yeah, but I think the shaker was from um, from Dig It. Okay. Yeah, but it's good to see George apparently enjoying the session. George Harrison. Mm -hmm. Um really like the new video uh in other beetle news uh let's see paul mccartney's eyes of the storm exhibit just opened at the brooklyn museum in new york it is running through august the 18th featuring many of the photos from paul's book released last summer of pictures of the beatles taken by paul from late 63 and early 64 when the beatles first visited america and witnessed the craziness of beetlemania and a touching yet sad story that you may have heard about related to this exhibit. There is film footage from 1964 that many Beatle fans have seen that it was included in the film Eight Days a Week of a young girl named Adrian, who was from Brooklyn. And in this footage, she says, 
I love the Beatles, and I'll always love them. Even when I'm 105 and an old grandmother, I'll love them. And Paul McCartney, if you are listening, Adrian from Brooklyn loves you with all her heart. Well, Paul recognized this, responded by making a video on Instagram, and he says, Hey, Adrian, it's Paul. Listen, I saw your video. I'm in Brooklyn now. I'm in New York. I finally got here. We got an exhibition, a photo exhibition. Come along and see it. In the caption, it added, and Adrian from Brooklyn, if you are listening, Paul McCartney from Liverpool loves you too. Well, sadly, it turns out that Adrian, whose real name is Adrian D'Onofrio, uh, died in 1992 from lymphoma at the mm. age of just 41. There was a report on NBC which had members of her kids just responding to this and uh, saying what a great mom they had. But just nice to know that Paul remembered this and reached out to her. It was a, you know, very nice gesture on Paul's yeah. part. Um, the John Lennon Estate has partnered with the company Luminate to create nine new meditation mixes of John Song Mind Games. The song mixes are slowed down and extended with four focusing on the brainwaves beta, delta, gamma, and theta that work with the app's frequencies to drive listeners deeper into consciousness. The nine mixes are paired with the phone's flashlight to create a trippy psychedelic experience. The project launched on May the 1st in honor of Mental Health Awareness Month. And Sean says, I'm very happy to be working with Luminate on this release for Mental Health Awareness Month. I think our Mind Games project is fun, meaningful, and potentially mind-expanding. I have been using the Luminate app for my own personal or my own personal meditations since it launched, and I've had many profound experiences. My father was famously into meditation. I remember trying the flicker machine he kept in the bedroom, which is what first introduced me to the idea of stroboscopic brainwave introduction. I thought it made sense to combine the music of mind games with the science of Luminate. I really hope people enjoy the results as much as I have. And Yoko Ono added, John was trying to convey the message that we all played mind games. But if you can play mind games, why not make a positive future with it to be a positive mind game? Mind Games is such an incredibly strong song. At the time, people didn't quite get the message because this was before its time. Now people would understand it. I don't think in those days people knew they were playing Mind Games anyway. Now you guys both purchased this. There it is. This is one of the screens. of. I just got it. It's free. Uh, it's a free app. Um, and I haven't tried it yet, but there are all once you sign up for it, there's all kinds of like warnings uh do you have epilepsy do you have uh you know all kinds of like because of the strobe and the flashing so if if maybe the next time we gather if i'm not here uh and it's just ken and alan um you, you might want to look in because i may have lost my mind um you know either that or uh you know it's supposed to be really wild with the with the light the the flashlight and i saw a brief video and it's like okay this is going to probably damage something that's left in my head, but we'll see. Just to hear these mind game mixes, either that or I'll have an other world, you know, otherworldly experience. I could tell you about alien abduction and stuff like that, maybe. <laughs> Alan, have you tried it yet? Uh, no, I, I, I didn't download the app. I, I did get the files of the new mixes and I listened to bits of them and, um, uh, it's not really, at least the bits that I heard are not really recognizable as the songs that they're from, but um, they're just sort of, you know, elongated, sort of new agey, spacey kind of um, mixes. And uh, I, I, I really probably shouldn't say anymore until I sit down and listen to them all the way through. Um, but I didn't have time. And uh yeah, it seems like an interesting idea. Oh, definitely. You got to hand it to, to Sean for thinking about this. Mm -hmm. um, an interesting way of promoting mind games, definitely. And uh, I'm going to try and look into that myself. You know, see folks, if I can... Folks, the next show, we'll all have lost our minds. All <laughs> three of us. 
Um, well, no one's ever accused me of having mental health anyway. So, you know, it's, <laughs> for me, it's just. You know. <laughs> okay. Other Lennon news. Coming out on June 28th is the DVD Revival 69, the concert that rocked the world, directed and produced by Ron Chapman. This is the live piece in Toronto concert shot by D.A. Pennebaker, which includes performances from the Plastic Auto Band, The Doors, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Little Richard, Jerry Lee Lewis, Alice Cooper, and Gene Vincent, described as a feature-length documentary that explores the nearly unbelievable story of the 1969 Toronto Rock and Roll Revival. Uh, through the iconic verite lens of D.A. Pennebaker, once-in-a-lifetime moments are captured between the festival's cross-generational bill, like Jim Morrison admiring Chuck Berry's performance from side stage, or Alice Cooper backing 50s icon Gene Vincent before launching into his own raucous solo show. But perhaps most remarkable is the debut of the Plastic Auto Band and how two Canadian kids in their early 20s, came to organize John Lennon's first major performance outside the Beatles. Another release concerning the live piece in Toronto concert, and this one's coming out June 28th, but a so different June, approach. Yeah. June 20th, what, what was the name of that again, Ken? Revival 69, the concert that rocked the world. Okay. Variety magazine is reporting, and in fact, we talked about this early last year. We heard about this. Kino Lorber has acquired the North American rights for a new documentary on the week that John and Yoko co-hosted The Mike Douglas Show in early 1972, titled Daytime Revolution. Both Yoko and Sean were creative consultants for the documentary, though they don't appear in it. Using archival footage from each of the 70-minute shows, as well as six interviews from surviving guests, including Ralph Nader, they tell the behind-the-scenes stories of these shows. Daytime Revolution, this is interesting, will first open theatrically later this year, followed by a home video, plus educational and digital releases on all major platforms. Very interesting that this is done in documentary style. I sure would like to see the entire week reissued like it once was on video cassette. There's never even been a DVD of it. <laughs> I think there was one in um, a, a, one of the South American countries has a, a DVD set of it that um, has sort of traveled around. Uh, oh. But yeah, we need it. We need a domestic release of that. It, it's kind of astonishing that we're getting a documentary without getting the actual set they really ought to put them both out at the same time if that's what they wanted if they if they do we know who, who actually owns the uh has the rights to the films the tapes of the shows i don't know don't know but it did come out on video cassette yeah, one... yeah. wasn't it didn't rhino put it out was it a, a rhino video cassette i'm not sure i, I think, think for some know. reason i think it was but, hmm. uh, does, is that and I missed uh, Ken daytime revolution no date yet for release no it's later That's this year later in the year okay um and in other Lennon news Julian Lennon will have a new book out of his photography called life's fragile moments that's on September the 9th Amazon UK says the images range from picturesque landscapes to urban street scenes, with each shot seeming to tell its own story. This diversity allows the reader to experience the unique perspective of a man who successfully combines different creative worlds. Yet the book is more than just a visual presentation. It also opens the door to Julian Lennon's world of thoughts. The illustrated book provides deep insights into the artist's creative process, his inspirations and emotions. I have seen a lot of his photography, and I'm very impressed with it. A lot of his nature shots, I think, are really very nice. But this will come out um, September the 9th, Life's Fragile Moments. In a new interview in USA Today, Ringo Starr said his new country album won't be out until at least October. He also said some very complimentary words about guitarist Steve Lukather. He says, I'll never get rid of Luke. He has a lifelong ticket. He's my last best friend. You need time to make best friends. He's an incredibly good musician and an incredible human being. End of quote. Hmm. Wow. 
sir adds a lot to the all-star band uh lineups and yep. a lot of the songs that he's co-written for ringo on his albums and eps so uh ringo obviously thinking very highly of him james uh mccartney's new song primrose hill which he co-wrote with sean lennon now has a new video made for it which you can catch on youtube it's just a pretty simple video of romantic couples in the park must be primrose hill and uh, at the very end, you can see James at the end uh, playing guitar and singing along with the song. It's it's really nice. Um, a few cover versions of Beatles songs to tell you about. The classic rock band Blue Oyster Cult have covered the Beatles classic If I Fell on their new album, which is called Ghost Stories. A little late in reporting this, but in March, a live album was released by The Who of a concert they gave at Chase Stadium in 1982, in which they performed live, I Saw Her Standing There, as well as Twist and Shout. It's the first ever audio release of the full show, and it came out as a triple album and double CD. And also the group Rockapella have recorded an acapella version of Let It Be, which is done extremely well. All right, we have, believe it or not, five passings to note here on the show this time first the death of mike pender who was the last surviving member of the moody blues he played keyboards and stayed with the band through the release of their ninth album octave in 1978 mike was important in the development and emergence of the mellotron which the moody's used on several of their recordings and he introduced the mellotron to john lennon and it was then used on the beatles recording of strawberry fields forever Upon the departure of Denny Lane from the Moody's, it was Pinder who recommended getting Justin Hayward into the band. Pinder was invited to play Mellotron for John Lennon's Imagine album, but when he found out the tapes in John's Mellotron looked like, quote, a bowl of spaghetti, <laughs> he ended up playing tambourine instead for John's song, I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. Now sad to announce that all five original members of the Moody Blues have passed. Mike Pinder was 82. Uh, also, oh, I'm sorry, no, I, I was going to, I thought you were going to ask us about the Moody's and Mike Pinder. I'm a huge Moody Blues fan, and, and I know Alan and you are, Ken. And uh, yeah, that was very sad that he passed. He left, um, he had, uh, the Moody Blues went on a hiatus in the mid 70s where each member went off and was doing solo stuff. And uh, Mike did an album called Promise, which is a pretty cool record. Um, and he also settled in California, um, started a new family and decided being a being a rock musician and having to tour and, you know, was had lost its luster. And he left the band when they were, you know, recording Octave. I think it's... Um, the album cover of Octave, you see the four members of the band facing you, mm -hmm. and Mike Pinder's back is to you like he's walking out the door. Something like that, either on the back cover, I think it might be. Okay. Um, I haven't seen a uh, scene. I haven't taken my my album out in a while, but that was very sad to hear about Mike Pinder, who worked for Mellotron, the company that made the Mellotron, before he was in the Moody Blues. So he had already a knowledge of this instrument what it, it could do so i think if i read what i if I, what i read was correct i think when he, they got one he finally got one and he probably he got a break i think because he worked for the company he was able to make modifications he knew how to do that hmm. which you know i think um really enhanced it for use within the moody blues and i think that's all he played was a Mellotron when it came to keyboards, I think. Um, which I've always found that instrument to be so fascinating uh, in how it works and that it is actually recording tape that is playing everything that you hear. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, rest in peace, Michael Pinder. Yeah, I didn't realize the symbolism of the, the cover of Octave. You know. Yeah, it, is, I think you only I, I, I can pull up a picture just to refresh my memory uh, but he did leave I don't think he finished the album with them um, yeah the front cover no 
the front cover, I can only see the front cover here. The front cover of the album does have four four members. Their backs facing to you, except for Graham Edge, the drummer, is turning around. But a fifth member is sort of obscured. Like he's he's blocked out of the, the picture in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing that's supposed to be symbolic of Mike Pinder not being in the band. Um, I also watched um, recently their, I don't know if you've seen their concert performance at the Isle of Wight, 1970, mm -hmm. uh, which I have on disc. And I finally watched it the other night. And Mike was very much, I mean, you think of Justin Hayward as the main vocalist. But Mike Tinder and Ray Thomas were very um, active on stage. They were like the MCs. And, um, you know, it was interesting watching Pinder really dig into the instrument and play it uh, during their performance. So the unique band, there's no other group like them, really. Yeah. I'm fortunate that I got to see the Moody Blues in concert a few times, but it was the more recent lineups with uh, Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Ray Thomas, Graham Edge. Yeah. And the two surviving members of the two replacement members who are both now out on the road solo. Out, um, Justin, um, John Lodge just put out a, uh, another solo album, which is a reinterpretation of Days of Future Past. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know he's touring. I think I saw that Justin Hayward has dates later this year. Yeah. Okay. Also, the death of Chan Romero. This was the musician who wrote and first recorded the song Hippie Hippie Shake. That was in 1959. Later, it was a hit across Europe for the Swinging Blue Jeans. And, of course, was covered by the Beatles for their live performances and for BBC Radio. And Paul played it live for a concert he gave in Liverpool several years ago. Chan Romero was 82. Also, there's the death of Richard Tandy, a member of ELO, known for uh, playing keyboards for most of their albums until the band breakup in 1986. He continued to record with Jeff Lynne when he reformed the band in the 2000s, the only original member to join him. When Jeff Lynne released his solo album Armchair Theater in 1990, George Harrison played on four of the album's tracks and Richard played on all of those songs. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a member of ELO in 2017. And Jeff Lynn issued a statement. It is with great sadness that I share the news of the passing of my longtime collaborator and dear friend Richard Tandy. He was a remarkable musician and friend, and I'll cherish the lifetime of memories we had together. Sending all my love to Sheila and the Tandy family, Jeff Lynn. Richard Tandy was 76. Did you want to say anything, Darren? Because I know you love ELO too. No, uh, he was. Um... <clears throat> Uh, when when uh, when Jeff Lynne brought ELO back, and I guess it was 2001 with the album Zoom, uh, there was plans for a tour. Tickets were put on sale. I had tickets for the tour that ultimately ended up getting canceled for lack of of uh, ticket sales, if you can believe that. And ELO played like maybe two promotional shows for broadcast. Like, I think one was for VH1 Storytellers. Um, I was at one of them. And, um, you know, the memory is beginning to rot a little bit. Uh, but uh, I was sitting where I was located. I was kind of close to Richard Tandy. Didn't actually know much about the inner workings of the band. And uh, realized, hey, there's one of the other members of ELO is still here. Because the rest of the group was all new. Rosie Vela. Uh, I don't know if that name rings a bell. She did a record eons ago. Rosie Vella was uh, one of the vocalists. I think was dating Jeff Lynn at the time. And uh, then when Jeff brought him back again as Jeff Lynn's ELO, uh, I think Richard Candy was uh, was playing with them the first time I saw them live, but wasn't there. Uh, so I think he had either quietly stepped away from performance altogether or would tour or perform when he was up to it. I heard he had, had some health issues you know, and then nothing, you know, nothing more until his passing. Mm. And, and ELO, of course, now saying goodbye with a farewell tour this year. Must, must have meant a lot to Jeff if he was the only member, you know, member to stay with him, you know. 
Yeah, well, it came down with ELO with, uh, to, to, to Jeff Richard Candy and Bev Bevan, the drummer, when all in the mid 80s, that was ELO was cut down to being a trio. And I don't know the relationship between Jeff Lynn and Bev Bev, Bev Bevan, except that Bev wanted the group to reform a few years after they broke up by the late 80s. And Jeff didn't want to do, wasn't interested. And, and along came the Electric Flight Orchestra Part Two, which was Bev Bevan's band. Um, until he retired, and now I guess he's still retired. Hmm. Okay. Um, a major musical figure in Dwayne Eddy passed away. Uh, he was a pioneering guitar player known for his twangy guitar sound, had many hits in the 50s and 60s, including Rebel Rouser, Because They're Young, 40 Miles of Bad Road, and Peter Gunn. Um, he also was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. This was in 1994. In 1987, he released his self-titled album, Dwayne Eddy, which featured George Harrison, Paul McCartney, and Jeff Lynne. Paul played bass and sang backing vocals for Dwayne's cover of Paul's Rockestra theme. And George and Jeff Lynne appeared with Dwayne for an instrumental written by Jeff called Theme for Something Really Important. And for a song written by Ravi Shankar and Dwayne Eddy called The Trembler. Got to tell you, those two instrumentals are dynamite. Um, Dwayne also performed Paul's Beatles song, And I Love Her, for the 2012 Music Cares Person of the Year tribute to Paul McCartney. That was on February 10th that year at the Los Angeles Convention Center. And Dwayne Eddy was 86. It's another one of those albums that... that uh, people like Carl Perkins did where they gathered together a lot of the superstars of that time and they paid tribute to Dwayne Eddy and Dwayne recorded with them. It's nice to have George and Paul on the same album there, though they're on different tracks. And then finally, the news that broke today of the death of Terry Hennebree. Terry Hennebree uh, was a versatile radio and television producer who first brought the Beatles into British homes, producing their debut on the radio program Saturday Club and their own series Pop Go the Beatles for the BBC Light program. Hennebury made no secret of his musical preference for jazz, and he got to know jazz greats like Oscar Peterson, Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, and Duke Ellington to perform for the BBC. In the spring of 1963, Brian Epstein negotiated a contract for the group's own series Pop Go the Beatles, and the BBC set a budget for £100 per episode, and Terry produced 13 of the 15 shows. Guest performers included The Searchers, The Hollies, and The Swinging Blue Jeans. Hannibury recalled of the sessions, they'd come into the studio and horse about. You had to crack the whip and get on the loudspeaker talkback key quite a lot and say, come on, chaps. They'd be lying on the floor giggling. I remember afternoons at the BBC Paris Cinema Studio where you were just looking at the clock, throwing up your hands in horror and thinking, will they ever settle down? People would get locked in the toilets and fool about, but you were, at the end of the day, getting some nice material out of them. It took time for Hennebury to see the Beatles' music that way, in a positive way. In the early days, he would chunter, those bloody Beatles, they haven't got a clue. I hate this music. <laughs> Terry Hennebree uh, was 91. By the way, if I didn't say it earlier, all the news about those cover versions comes from Scott O'Rourke, just to make sure I didn't forget. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. And that's all the news we have for you this time. So let's start the bulk of this show by talking about the newly remastered Let It Be. Um, we've all seen it. Darren and I went to go to um, an event in New York City, a press event, where Michael Lindsay Hogg was there. And so was uh, Jonathan Clyde, who's the head of production for Apple. And there was a brief Q&A before they showed the film. And Alan Light from Sirius XM interviewed the two of them. And then they showed a brief film, which was actually shown on Disney+. Plus if you try to bring up Let It Be, between a conversation with Peter Jackson and Michael Lindsay Hogg, and then we watched the film. And it was, uh, you know, it's quite an honor to be invited to these things. And I was really blown away by the film. 
and the picture quality is really sharp, sharper than I've ever seen it. But more than that, <laughs> I, I was more impressed with the audio than anything else. And um, especially in watching the rooftop concert, and I suppose the fact that we're in a, you know, a movie theater with lots of speakers there, that audio was beefed up and it sounded like you were on the rooftop with them. It felt that close and um, made you realize what a great live band the Beatles were. But, um, you know, what were your thoughts? Each of you will just talk about watching the film first and we'll go a little bit more into the event and and what was said there uh, a little bit later on. Uh, Darren, what did you think? Um, immediately, right at the beginning, you can tell how wonderful it looks. Um, the restoration done by Peter Jackson's team um, is remarkable. I mean, from the first, the minute you see uh, Ringo's bass drum head, uh, and, and and Mal Evans picking it up and walking it over to uh, the drum kit. And they're building Ringo's riser. Uh, I mean, it's just razor sharp. And that scene, that opening scene, always had, in my memory, was always grainy. Um, probably because, again, I'm watching it on, I think the last time, I used to, I, Beetlefest would show it. And that was probably the last time I, I saw a chunk of that movie was well, when it was screened at Beetlefest. But I also believe I, I probably rented it maybe on more than one occasion, early 80s from the local video rental store. So again, the quality was not going to be that good. Um, and who knows how the tape was manufactured. But that opening scene, the whole movie, but the opening scene was always grainy in my memory, what I remember of it. And seeing this, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, you'll immediately like a wow. And uh, and the colors that they had as a backsplash on the wall of Twickenham Studios was uh, is really, I mean, it really is a nice setup. Uh, you can understand the band maybe not liking that as a rehearsal space because it was, you know, they're kind of in a nook in this massive room, this massive hall studio. Uh, movie theater, movie, movie studio. But I mean, that's what struck me was immediately the quality of the picture. And uh, the sound, like Ken said, it really have seeing it in the movie theater. I watched it yet again last night here at home. And, you know, it's really got a punch to it that I doubt the original, you know, original cuts had. Hmm. Um, and it, it, it's sort of like, trying to explain it like my, my daughter was watching with me and the experience now and I think we'll all talk about this is different today from what we remember from however we saw it in the past whether it was in 70 in the theaters or home video laser disc um, maybe because we've seen Get Back and we have the whole the time, the setting the whole background backstory is, is changed now. We know more about what was going on. Just the vibe of the movie is different now. Um, and it almost plays like a um, sampler of Peter Jackson's documentary. This is all of the in-between song banter and debates and discussions and false starts taken out and condensed into 80 some odd minutes of the best of get back. It's kind of what it looks like now. And um, it had been a real long time since I'd seen the film. So when, when they're, when they're done, well, you know, in that opening scene where they're setting a Bringo's drum kit and it cuts into the music, the music then doesn't stop the rest of the way, which is sort of what I forgot about the movie having seen Peter Jackson's documentary where you're getting a day by day chronicle of that entire month. Well, mm -hmm. now here is nothing but nonstop music song after song after song coming at you. Uh, and you could now, now we know all about the background backstory 
and now we're watching the original movie from 1970, and you can even notice, uh, you know, f changes in facial hair, that these shots, these scenes were taken at different times. You know, this isn't a chronological order. This is, you know, a condensed film. Um, so it was like, like almost like seeing it for the first time, in a way, even though you knew what was going to happen. And it is, it, it's, you know, I think anyone who questioned whether or not we needed the original Let It Be after Peter Jackson's documentary, uh, you, you, you can't ask that question after you've actually seen this new, uh, this new uh, recut. It's not even a recut, you know, remastering, which, you know, isn't an accurate description either. And there seems to be. Every, everything I've heard is uh, it, it could there's more positivity towards it coming out in physical formats than than there was when Get Back came out. I've been hearing a lot that probably will be on a uh, disc later in the year, whereas we didn't get that feeling with Get Back. But um, what do you think, Alan? Generally speaking, I loved it. Uh, I mean, visually, it looks great. And the sound was great too. Uh, there are a couple of couple of things. I mean, f first of all, um, I never really suffered from this idea that Let It Be was a depressing film about them breaking up, because it kind of wasn't. I mean, you know, we look at it now and we see them, you know, having some fun in a lot of it. And that was always in the film. Nothing's changed. Nothing's new. And I, I think really the problem that we've all had with Let It Be has more to do with the Beatles themselves and the way they spoke about it. And particularly John and particularly in the 1970s, was it 1970 Rolling Stone interview mm. um, where, you know, he was very down on it and, uh, and George was always kind of down on it too. And we know that for instance, in the early nineties, Apple was trying to get together a special edition to release on DVD. Um, they had interviews with, various people who worked on it and and they had Neil Aspinall apparently in one of his few interviews where he's not wearing a hat. Um, so whether they're going to use all of this stuff, if and when they put out a home version, who knows, but they have it, you know, they, they were preparing to do it, but they, they never, some something stopped them always from putting it out. And I think it was basically the negative feeling that the Beatles themselves had about it. For me, the only problem with Let It Be As We've Always Known It is that the, uh, you know, I had it on Laserdisc and I have the, the VHS that came out in the, what was it, 80s? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in terms of picture quality, they were, it would be too much to say dismal, but they were heading towards dismal. It was sort of dark and, you know, nothing like the kind of, you know, bright colors that we see in the new one or in Peter Jackson's Get Back. Um, so, you know, I mean, I've always sort of wanted a, a, a visually crisper cleaner version of the film um but that's that's really just the the state of the copy it's not really about the content of the film the work okay a couple of things that i wanted to point out about the new version first of all the ending um i kind of liked how in the original let it be you know john says i hope we pass the audition and he turns and they freeze him and it says the end and there's, you know, the closing uh, vid visual uh, over the sort of laughing outtake of the Get Back Coda. Well, the laughing outtake of the Get Back Coda is now gone from the film. And basically what they do is you see John turn and walk towards the door and he keeps going for a couple of seconds. And then they cut to an outtake of Oh Darlin'. Um, 
which, you know, is great to have something new. Um, what I probably would have done is let it end the way it ends and then put the new ending with O'Darlin and the new credits, which run for several minutes. I, I don't know why they didn't do that. Um, another thing is that, you know, well, the sound is great, you know, nice new mix, but they did one thing that struck me as, uh, you know, another thing I wouldn't do. When they're jamming in the Apple studio and they have one jam where George starts and begins singing Kansas City and Paul is singing Miss Ann. Um, on the original, you hear both of those and then you sort of see George look over and Paul stops and picks up Kansas City too. And it's kind of like a little bit of competition between George and Paul. And there is a real look of satisfaction on George's face when everybody continues with Kansas City. Now, Paul later does Miss Ann in the same medley, mm -hmm. uh, but the beginning, it was sort of, you know, George versus Paul, Kansas City versus Miss Ann, Kansas City and George win. Big smile from George, okay? In the new mix, you can vaguely hear Miss Ann if you know it's there. If you don't know it's there, you can't tell, you know, there's, you hear some other vocal line in the background, but it's mixed way down and you can't tell what it is. And so you still see George smiling and all that stuff, but you can't really see why, you know? So they're presenting it as if, you know, okay, so George is just having a good time singing Kansas City, but there was something else going on there, which we now no longer see. And I wouldn't have done that. I would have left it. You know, it it makes it a uh, a neater performance. You know, I mean, the the performance is a little bit sloppy if you have two people singing different songs at the same time, and so they fix that. But there was a reason it was that way, and um, I kind of suspect that we can. Well, I kind of suspect that Michael Lindsay Hogg knew that <laughs> that that was going on. That's why he put it in the film. I don't know why he um, revised his opinion about that, or maybe he just forgotten said, let's, let's just make this a, a, a more fastidious performance. Um, but so those are the, those are my, my two things about the new version, but otherwise, you know, it just looks great. It sounds great. It was fun to see. Um, now the other thing about it not being, about the Beatles breakup. Um, first of all, the real impetus for the Beatles breakup was the advent of Alan Klein, okay? Now they had some disagreements before that as any band does. I mean, we hear about disagreements in the White Album, although the White Album box set didn't really give much of an impression that that there was tension there, but we know that there was some, you know, Ringo leaving, all that stuff. Um, but, you know, all bands have disagreements. It's, it's just part of being in a band. It's, you know, right. part of being human. <laughs> um, and so what do we see in Let It Be? You know, the, the whole thing seems to be colored by this one dispute that George and Paul are having. And, we're only seeing an excerpt of it in Let It Be and also in Get Back, but I think we see a longer excerpt. But we also have the Nagra tapes and the Nagra tapes tell us everything. And it's kind of clear that really at the heart of that discussion is a, a, a difference in point of view from George and Paul. They're running through these new songs that they're just learning. Paul thinks when there's a problem, we should stop and fix it. George thinks, why don't we just keep playing them until they're completely under our fingers and things will take care of themselves or once it's under your fingers, we can stop and fix it. Now, that is not an unusual dispute in a rock band. You know, it's completely reasonable, but we only see this little thing and we see George sort of leaning away from the mic, 
you know, so that it's not picked up, which it is anyway. And says, you know, whatever you want me to play, I'll play it or I won't play it all. If you don't want me to, whatever it is that will please you, I'll do it. Okay, that sounds a little tense and it was a little tense, but the basic dispute that it was part of was not that unusual. It was just a different point of view on how to rehearse. And that is the only dispute in the film, unless you want to bring in Kansas City and Miss Anne, which is really just sort of a musical contest, you know, and one of them prevails, one of them doesn't. And unusually, it's George. You know, probably most of the time Paul got his way. This time George gets his way. And it's kind of interesting to see. Um, and the other, other thing I wanted to mention about the non-breakupness of Let It Be is that they were together the rest of the year and did Abbey Road. Abbey Road, an incredibly together album, you know? Uh, and so they broke up after it, but, you know, John didn't, I was starting to say that the impetus was Alan Klein for the breakup. John didn't meet him until like the 27th or 26th of January. That's like four or five days before the end of the filming. So that seed wasn't even really sown yet, you know? So, I think there are just different ways to look at Let It Be, and I hope that the cleaned up version will, you know, sort of help people get over the idea that it's depressing because it's really not. Anyway, so those uh, those points that you you made, Alan, about the alteration of the end, and maybe uh, playing with the mix on in the Kansas City portion, technically mm -hmm. mean that this isn't exactly what came out in 1970 right that there was a little were these the only instances where you think there was any alteration made to the original film it was the any only thing that struck me um and what i did after i watched it um and sort of accidentally found a file of the film on my computer um i played the file and I played the file of the laser disc and compared bits where I thought maybe there was something different and they were always pretty much the same. You know, I checked the Miss Ann Kansas city thing too, just to make sure it wasn't my imagination. And, you know, it's really clear on the old one, what's going on. Okay. Um, but everything else I checked, it, it was exactly the same. And visually the, the, the scene, scene for scene, it was the same. Nothing else really struck me as a big change. There's a few things I want to comment on based on everything you just said there, Alan. And first of all, hopefully we'll get to the bottom as to why those two changes were made, especially not having the code of get back at the end. Um, but you just said, well, first of all, I happen to believe that there are a lot of reasons why the Beatles broke up and maybe Alan Klein was the biggest reason. But as far as, our knowledge of the Beatles recording Abbey Road after all this, did the public know that? Did they actually know the order of how all this music was recorded? I think so, uh, because I remember, um, do you remember Go Magazine? Are you old enough for that? It used to be one of these freebie magazines that was given out in record stores. And I used to go get it every week. And when Let It Be was filmed, they had a, a big article about what it was going to be and you know it was going to be um the beatles were going to give a concert and it was going to be a documentary about them rehearsing for the concert and then the concert and then that never happened really like the concert never happened um so we we knew that they had recorded something and filmed something in january 69 and in the fall of 69 uh acetates of the original Get Back album began to get played on radio stations until the cease and desist orders went out. So we knew that Let It Be was done and we knew what it sounded like. Well, mm -hmm. not what it was eventually going to sound like, but what it sounded like in its sort of Let It Be naked phase. Um, and the, Or I should say the Glyn Johns Get Back phase, which is what it was. And then suddenly, a month or two later, Abbey Road came out. So we knew that Let It Be was out of order we, at the time, mm. anyway. I think, you know, those are knowledgeable Beatle fans that were aware of that. But to a lot of the general public, 
the movie came out the same time of the breakup. So right. they tied the two of them together. Um, and also, I certainly hope that there is a physical release of this, partly because anything that's ever been released before by the Beatles is a part of history, and it should come out anyway. But I also think that even though there's no narrative in Let It Be, and we'll talk about that as to whether or not you think that's a benefit or whether it suffers because of that, um, it's an easier film to take than watching almost eight hours of Get Back. Let it be for the general public, for the casual fan, for a new fan. It's easier to digest all that stuff. There's a lot of people I know who love the Beatles, but found it hard to sit through eight hours of Get Back. So hmm. I, I know you're not like that, Alan. <laughs> it's hard to imagine it being hard to sit through eight hours of the Beatles. But what can I say? <laughs> you know, there are people who feel that way, you know. How many bands can you think of where you can sit through take after take after take of every song? I know for us, it's fine when it comes to the Beatles, but not everybody feels the same way that, that we do. But, um, and another thing, you know, I remember we talked about Let It Be around the time that Get Back came out. And I had watched it for the first time in a long time. And I had said, it's not as depressing a film as I thought it was, because I always heard that it was depressing mainly because it came out the same time as the Beatle breakup and you hear the fighting and the whole thing about Paul and George is so overblown that little argument there and I think that that also has to do with the fact that these are the Beatles and because they are the biggest band in the world everything is magnified times a thousand <laughs> because it's the Beatles and you're not used to seeing them argue Right. You're used to seeing a hard day's night and help and, you know, being funny and witty all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but watching it a few years ago when Get Back came out, I just said, you know, what is the big deal about this movie? It's it's more joyous than anything else. And there's plenty of times when, the, when they're all smiling and having fun. Um, and do you think that the fact that, because we're now so spoiled with Get Back, and we can analyze day by day what they were going through. We know so much more now than we knew then. Although in the other the other podcast I do, Talk More Talk, we just did a show on Let It Be with Ken Womack. And Ken was saying, well, we know a little bit more than we did before, even though we have eight hours of footage here. But we'll never know everything that went on during those sessions. And even though there is lots of audio bootlegs of, of the Let It Be stuff that we can all listen to, it's not the same thing as watching them. That's true. Um, That's there are true. Times... But, you know, the Nagras do give you pretty much minute by minute almost the entire session, except for a few reels that are lost. Yeah. So those, those I think, gave everybody a really good idea of what really happened at those sessions, including when they were having fun. You know, people who collected the bootlegs of uh, the audio bootlegs have always said why why does you know why uh they really second guessing michael lindsey hogg you know why didn't he choose more of the fun sections you know and put them in mm -hmm. but the, but he did do some so i don't know but when you, you know when I get back you also realize that there was a lot of a lot of fun there during the sessions mm -hmm. but then why did the beatles feel that way about let it be all these years why did they continued to permeate that that feeling about let it be and then when when Ringo watched it when Ringo watched get back and Paul watched get back and they didn't I guess they didn't remember a lot of the good times right you know and Ringo is still saying that he like he likes uh get back but he doesn't really let it be gives him no joy I don't know if he's watched the, re the remastered one. I'm I'm not sure, but I think he has. You know, my my take is that, and we've discussed this, and this has been said before. Um, it was released on the heels of McCartney's announcement, and you know, being too young to to really um, be, uh, to remember any of this, except I did see Let It Be in the theaters when I was five. Um, McCartney's announcement never really said anything about the Beatles breaking up. Right. It was that I'm not working with John anymore. And even there, there was no final stamp 
we won't be writing songs together anymore. Uh, and that's where it sat. So somewhere in the interpretation of this, it became somebody sent a subliminal message around the globe that said, the Beatles have broken up. Uh, and am I right? I mean, there really was never any formal declaration that the four are over. The, the, the band is over. Um, what, however, everyone in, ended up interpreting McCartney's press release in April that the Beatles had broken up. Everyone was under the impression he'd broken up. And boom, here comes this film. So everyone's looking at it as, gee, it must have just been shot, like Alan was saying. I mean, we didn't. Ha they didn't have a, you know, some people might have known that this is footage from a year and a half or so ago that we're watching, but it just seems like this was the last thing that they did. Here's the album to prove it. New album. They broke up last month. Here's the album. You know, boy, it's the end. We're watching the end. Um, then the film goes out of circulation for so long where if you wanted to see it, hardcore fans would track down bootleg pressings, bootleg prints. Or if you had one of, uh, you know, like Alan, you have the VHS and the, and the laser disc. But I don't think that, that, that those weren't available to the casual fan. The movie's gone. It's out of circulation. You got to go on what you heard about it or what you remember seeing about it. And it was the last thing. And it came out when they broke up. And it just became almost like a... Almost like a... Um, I don't know, not folklore. You know, revisionist history became the reality. What we remembered, we experienced was the reality of it now. And I could see Ringo not sitting down and watching it from beginning to end. You know, Ringo was there and thinks of it as being the next to last big session we ever did. And the breakup was ugly. And this came out around that time. Therefore, and you don't even know if he's been also hearing this talk through the years. Oh, it was you guys were breaking up then. So, um, I think that's why a lot of our eyes have been open to no. They figured out a way that when they were making music together, um, the magic was still there. I really do think that if Alan Klein and there's those scenes which are very interesting and in get back, where John is talking about Alan Klein like he had just seen a deity, uh, <laughs> you know, and that Alan Klein is just you got to meet this guy. You know, and I'm like, holy smoke, John is completely taken by this Alan Klein. That's the beginning. Sorry, I mean to point at you like that. That's the beginning of the end for me, for them, is that moment. You see how John latched on to this guy he just met and was so excited for the others to meet him. And Paul didn't even then you got the impression Paul couldn't care less I got off topic there a little bit by bringing that up but I just think it's like the fact that the film went out of circulation for so long um, you start buying into what you thought you saw or thought you remembered and what you were told through the through the years through the decades and it's become something that it wasn't but it's surprising to me that the Beatles themselves believed it. I mean, they lived it. They would know the good and the bad times of those sessions, hopefully. Well, think about, for, for anything in your life, think about an event that took place 20, 30 years ago in your life and what you remember of it. You know what I mean? Time passes. Your memory, pieces of your memory fall off and, and are missing. You know, so your perception of an event... Uh, I found, you know, uh, that, no, that, that day never happened the way you remember it, Darren. I was, you weren't there at that time. You know, years go by and, you know, I mean, it's like watching, for the Beatles, these films and these albums are like watching home movies over and over and over and over again. It wouldn't surprise me if, Ringo or Paul never saw Let It Be from beginning to end. Ever, maybe. 
I mean, or, they didn't go to the premiere. Or 50 years ago. He's right. Who, Ringo, one night, 19, someone, one, one rainy night in 1987 decides to put on Let It Be. I doubt it. And, um, you know, so he's made, pro and I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't watch it now that it's been restored. So his memory of it is what maybe has been, has been influenced by what the media, the public, their memories are. My Mick, you know what I'm saying? Um, so in that case, it's great that Let It Be is back. So we could get actually, we have everything now into per, in perspective. The timeline and the state of the band, state of mind within the band. It's all like kind of explained there now. Um, one other thing that get back, oh, uh, that, and that, um, uh, um, help me become aware of that isn't aware and let it be is you're not aware of and watching just let it be is the the one thing that they couldn't settle on was what they were doing what are we rehearsing for what's the end of this project are we playing by the pyramids are we playing to a studio audience uh, do we even want to play sure where well, I don't know and then George walks out. And none of that is explained in Let It Be. So you watch Let It Be and you go, that was great. They were jamming and recording their new album. No, they actually weren't really recording a new album. They were coming up with material and rehearsing it for something that they didn't even know themselves. Well, that they, were, they, were working, they were working on a new album because there's that moment in the the um was it the get back book where there's a list that george martin had put together of all these song titles and i thought that they were song titles for what they were considering for a concert but they were for the next album and all things must pass was in there yeah so <laughs> you know that's what i wanted to ask the two of you we're so used to having a narrative in a documentary now and when you're used to seeing Get Back, a day-by-day -day account of what was going on, like you said, Darren, there's no mention in Let It Be of George Harrison quitting. Right. There's no mention of what their intentions are. You just see them. No mention of where they are when they go from Twickenham to Apple. Right. Or Billy right. Christian turning up. Or right. who Heather is. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because these things have been complaints in a lot of the reviews that I've read, you know, like we don't get to like, suddenly this uh, black guy turns up on keyboards. We're not told anything. They're in, the thing is, you know, at the time that it came out, um, we had already had the get back single, which said the Beatles with Billy Preston. So when you see Billy Preston turn up in the film or when you did in 1970, and since then, you just sort of knew who it was, you know, and with Heather, you do see her walk in with Paul and Linda. So you could guess that it, you know, maybe Linda's daughter and you would be right. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, maybe I, I, I wonder why he didn't, you know, even have, you know, just like a, a title to say, you know, they began beginning Twickenham Studios and then a title saying Apple Studios, although in a way he did, because when they get to Apple Studios, they, they begin with uh, For You Blue and they show the golden plate that says Apple that's on outside the door. So maybe that was supposed to indicate to us that they've gone to Apple. But, um, you know, a lot of people, it turns out, uh, who were, you know, born last Tuesday or haven't been paying attention for the last 50 years, just don't know what this is and find Let It Be confusing because it doesn't tell us either in a, a title or narratively or any other way. So people find it confusing in a way that they didn't find it in 1970, because in 1970, it was still sort of a current thing. We knew who these people were. We knew what was going on. We'd read about, uh, you know, it going from Twickenham to Apple. Um, we 
don't know, and and there's there's nothing in Michael's film about Magic Alex and how that delayed them further because he could put in his studio that didn't work and had to be ripped out. That cost them two days. But, you know, when you think about it, this whole project, January 2nd to January 31st, and ignore the fact that they got together the next January to record I Me Mine and they took uh, um, John's song uh, Across the Universe from the 1968 session, forgetting that. Basically, they rehearsed and recorded a whole album January 2nd to January 31st with a week off because George quit and they needed to set up Apple and then they needed to tear Apple apart because of Magic Alex and then finally back in. So that's really like three weeks or less. They rehearsed from scratch and recorded an album and it was Let It Be you know, which is not bad as albums go. So, uh, you know, it's kind of an amazing feat. And I think when people focus more on the fact that they were fighting and breaking up and all this stuff, it, it, they're sort of ignoring the fact that this group came together with nothing prepared for the next album. And after th three weeks worth of recording, had an album. That's kind of amazing. Well, I remember when Get Back was about to premiere and there was a promo film that was made for it. The way that it was presented, it, it kind of read like the Beatles have one month. They have to come up with a new album. They have to give a concert. Hmm. They pull it off. They only have this one month. You know, they have a deadline. So it was kind of presented that way and it made the story far more interesting. Although, you know, we've talked about this when, when Get Back came out i mean we knew that ringo had to film the magic christian in february so he wasn't going to be available but what if they didn't pull it off it'd still be the beatles they can work on the remainder of the songs that made up let it be you know when when ringo came back you know but it's just the fact that they did pull it off that was miraculous and it was even more miraculous that they came up with new material because they could have just as easily have done a concert and performed the White Album or songs from the White Albums that just came out. So, you know, the story behind Let It Be is just as fascinating as the music. <laughs> <laughs> but do you guys think that that the, the film Let It Be does suffer in a way because there is no narrative? It just lays it out. The Beatles are rehearsing. They're having a lot of fun rehearsing, developing new songs, and they give a concert. And that's all that you really need. I kind of think that, you know, you, this is the film. This is what it was. This is the way Michael Lindsay Hogg made it in 1970. I think there's no point in trying to add narrative elements now. Um, it probably makes sense to watch the film, watch them learning the new songs, jamming, going to the rooftop. And that's the film. And if you want to know more, you can watch the Get Back film. You can read various books. Uh, there's lots and lots of information about what's going on and what the setup was, what the outcome was, all of that. Um, but I would say just, you know, just take Let It Be at face value as it is. Uh, and if you want to do extra homework, you can do it. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Let It Be was meant to be a documentary of the Beatles at work in the studio. Period. And that's all it is. And it works as that. As Beatle historians, um, and wanting to know more, um, we might notice little nuances about how come George had um, facial hair a little bit, a little scruffiness. It's gone now, it's back. You know, boy, he can grow a beard within hours. It's amazing. We're not picking up on things like that. These are the little subtle indications are that we're, 
what Michael had was all of this tape, and he wanted certain moments that he captured uh, together, and the songs that they were working on together, and didn't really worry too much about little subtleties like this was shot on the ninth, this was shot on the fourteenth. Doesn't matter. You know, they go together. This is a documentary about the Beatles working in the studio, period, leading up to, as it turns out, the roof. And that was our plan all along, to go up on the roof, period. And that's what comes off. And like Alan said, if you want to know, if you want the movie put into context, read some books uh, and watch Get Back. And Get Back is what takes this month of sessions and turns it into a day-by-day -day, uh, video diary uh, of how that whole thing was done. You like Let It Be? This document. Now let's see what they were doing day by day and how we got these scenes and how these songs were really born and created. And uh, coming to this performance on the roof, which for about half of the session, half of the month, the roof was not even discussed. It was not a possibility. It was not an option. It was not one that was brought up. Um, so they can coexist. I think it's important that, I mean, for the novice Beatle fan or music fan, you might not get all these little points. I don't know if it's that important for, you know, someone who wants to oh, just experience the movie, has to know the ins and outs. But um, I don't think Let It Be suffers because it doesn't have a narrative, because it didn't warrant one. It accomplished its goal of capturing the Beatles working together in the studio. Getting, well, see, the Get Back name was changed because they were getting back to being that four-piece band. Um, because two years before that, they were making Sgt. Pepper. And that was a completely different creative environment. Um, random thought that I always found fascinating. We could close with this if you want. Um, the timing of it all. We know now looking back and knowing how the trends in the music industry, bands signing contracts where they were under, they were obligated to deliver two albums a year. Um, none of that is in play anymore anything even slightly resembling that. Sergeant Pepper comes out right at the end of May in the UK, 1967, June 2nd here, so midway through 67. As far as the Beatles were concerned, there was no Magical Mystery Tour album, right? That was a creation of capital. So a year and a half has elapsed. Sergeant Pepper comes out, by what is it, maybe roughly approximately the spring, early summer, 68, they're now beginning to work on these new songs for the next album. And they're working on them, they're working on them, they're working on them, they're working on them, they're working on them. The album finally comes out in November. It's the White Album. That's a year and a half in between Sgt. Pepper and the White Album. That's a long time for that, that time to go that long between albums. The White Album was released, I think it was around the third week in November, give or take. Mm -hmm. November 22nd. The Beatles are back in the studio within five to six weeks making more new music, moving on almost as if the White Album didn't exist. They just put it out. Today, five, six weeks, the record company would be putting out the 10th different colored vinyl variation. You know <laughs> what I mean? Or the band would just be starting out on their two-year farewell tour or something like that. But here the Beatles put out to finally finish the White Album. Should be able to sit back with their feet up. They don't. For one reason or another, they didn't do that. Beginning of January, back in the studio working on a new album. And that's something that gets... And then, <laughs> then once they're done with this Get Back project, and there is no plan in place for how, when, and why, and who's going to put it out, edit it, the film, the movie. They're recording songs for another new album, Abbey Road. It's a fascinating way that they end. There was so there was so pro, uh, prolific at that point and, uh, and productive at that point here, as it turns out, the end. Just 
you know, kind of a random observation. I always thought it was fascinating that they were working on Let It Be. The Let It Be project started, Get Back, in Twickenham. They just put an album out. Mm -hmm. And they don't even break in. I mean, maybe in Get Back, there might be a moment where they pull out one of their old songs. But the White Elm's like, forgotten about. Moved on, but done. Finished ancient history. Paul's talking about the footage of them in Rishikesh, uh, which was less than a year earlier, like it was home movies from 20 years ago. Remember that scene where he's talking about watching the films? He's talking about them like this was in the 50s. It was less than a year ago. It's gone. It's over. Moved on. I think there's um, I think there's one step in the evolution of get back let it be that um would clarify some of this for you which is that originally the idea was to do some concerts to promote the white album and presumably they would have been playing white album material um and that evolved over december um 68 to the idea of well why don't we why don't we work up new stuff and play a live concert and the live concert will be the new album with new material um but originally there was this idea of promoting yeah. the white album by mm -hmm. playing some concerts um and somehow it, that just evolved by the time they actually could get into a studio and, and get filming it was a totally different project but just the fact that they went into this new project thinking, let's re all right, let's film ourselves recording uh, some new music for the new album. You just gave us 30 songs five weeks ago and you need to record. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you know what I would be like, why are we recording a new album? We just spent. I don't know how many how all told the white album from session one to the end, how long it took, but it probably took what? Five months, give or take, six, four months total. Yeah. We just recorded 30 songs for goodness gracious. I got to record more. I'm going to form the Plastic Ono band. I'm leaving. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> the, pl the Plastic Ono Wings band. Anyway. So I don't see why they couldn't have done a concert where they performed their new stuff mixed with the White Album. Yeah. Yeah. But then it comes down, maybe they would have. Maybe if the initial plan of let's play this unique concert in front of a studio audience or in Egypt or something. Uh, you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna schlep out to Egypt to play a half an hour's worth of new material. Maybe they would have incorporated white album tracks. Or maybe they thought it was even more special if all the songs were brand new and the public didn't know it. They weren't familiar with it. How special would that be? And we will see them there. <laughs> All right. So uh, why don't we uh, tackle another subject here, which is the Mind Games box set, which is due out. It's either July 12th or the 19th now. And we got all the information about what will be on the various configurations. And I know that, uh, Darren, do you have everything all laid out yeah in i have <laughs> i have these are computer i'm looking up at computer screens folks I, we all are but i have the press release and i have john's website open here and um i'd be curious to uh hear how the two of you reacted to the announcement now we knew an announcement we, what day was it an announcement was coming on wednesday yes there was a teaser that kind of floated out there which i put on uh, my Facebook pages, and I don't know if I put it on the show's Facebook page, uh, a teaser that an announcement was coming the next day. Um, so when you guys sat down with your morning coffee, I'd love to know your reaction to the size, scope, and price of uh, what uh, was coming uh, out of the John Lennon camp. Hmm. Well, I knew that I wasn't going to buy the <laughs> box set. It's it's pointless. <laughs> the the all things must pass one was over a thousand dollars. This was 
thirteen hundred. But you it? didn't know yet. You had just opened your, you know, before you actually saw it with the price on it. You knew obviously, chances are I'm not going to get it because it's going to be expensive. Yeah. Uh, but you didn't know like. Oof, you I'm know. kind of expecting now with every archival album, there's going to be some Uber box set coming out. You know? Gee, I hope not. <laughs> well, it doesn't bother me because I don't have to buy that, but I will buy the next peg lower, which would be the box set with all the, the audio material that I need on there. So um, I'm kind of pleased with what I've seen, although um, what disappoints me and, and it's impossible for me to even say that because i'm more impressed with the lennon camp and what they've done with their two box sets so far but this is very similar along the same lines with having a remix having an elements mix an elemental mix uh what is it the the evolutionary documentary i think it's called um and outtakes as well that's kind of like what i expected but the only disappointment is there are no unreleased songs at all. It's the same 12 songs that are on the Mind Games album. And um, the other thing that I found interesting was that when the vinyl EP came out on Record Store Day with the four tracks on there, one of those tracks was I'm the Greatest. You know, it was an outtake of I'm the Greatest in there. And that's not on the box set. <laughs> it's not included in there. The Blu-ray audio, which is in the Uber box set, has everything else, but I don't see anything about I'm the Greatest. You know, it's basically those 12 songs that make up Mind Games and all these different versions of it, which fit on two Blu-rays. So I'm happy for all the material. It, it goes as in-depth as you can go into each song on Mind Games. But, you know, you had extra songs on Plastic on Old Band from rehearsals and all, and... I was kind of hoping that there'd be more of that somehow. Rock and roll people could have been on there. Um, True. I just don't know why it's strictly the 12 songs. And and, and that is something that didn't even, in the scope, in the, in the size of the Uber box and the price, and which we're going to get to in a moment, the contents i think the music i was so blown away by uh the other aspects it never occurred to me that you're right it, there isn't typical box set you know material where you're getting you know outtakes and songs that were works in progress there had to be no there are outtakes of the songs on mind games there's just no, no but nothing that's not mind games on there right Right. Um, the greatest being a good example. Yeah, that didn't even phase me till just now, because I was so taken by holy smokes! Hmm. Look at the size of this. Look at this. Yeah. But I like the fact that there's a two LP, two CD version, which is basically the remix of the album and the outtakes. Okay, that's for the more casual fan, and then you have a six CD set which is what I'm going to end up getting. Okay. But uh, the Uber box set sure sounds nice. There's no doubt about it. It's got a lot of tchotchkes in it, as I like to call them. But, um, you know, not many of us can can afford that amount. But Plus it's sold out now. Yeah. What's that? Plus it's sold out now. So yeah. apparently it, they made 1,100 it, copies. I it's supposed to be worldwide. That's what I heard anyway. I bought it. I ordered it. And it was a little bit against my better judgment. But the collector in me won the the debate in my head. There's always a lot of voices inside my head. Uh, and this was the debate of Darren, really. $1,300? More than that. A little more than that. Um Thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah, but thirteen hundred dollars. You shut up. But but let me look at this thing. Yeah, I know thirteen hundred smack. That was like going on in my head for a good part of Wednesday. Um, um, yet it still did sell out in less than twenty four hours. 
And I would fall into the category of those who can't afford it, who bought it anyway, and will now begin a diet of crackers for dinner for the next uh, month and change. Alan, when you saw the price tag, when you looked and investigated, when you first looked down at the specifics, your reaction was? Well, okay. I first saw it um, using a link that Adrian, my co-author, sent to me um, that was, I believe, a, a, a British universal uh track listing for it. So it was before the press release came and I clicked on it and it went to the sort of Uber box and the price that was given there was 1350 pounds or $1,695, which is about $350 more than it actually turns out to be. Although I checked again this morning and it still says 1695 on that website. Um, but I pretty much said, look, um, got to draw the line here. I can't do it. It seems a little silly to, um, continue buying these mega things that are, what makes the mega are beyond what actually interests me, which is the music, you know, for $168, I can get all of the music that I would be getting in the Uber set. Um, including the surround mixes, which mean a lot to me um, on the two Blu-rays. So, uh, you know, I can, I'm not getting the Newtopian things and, the, and Yoko's Danger Box and the various other things that come with the Uber set. And um, part of me wishes I was, but on the other hand, you know, I, I got the All Things Must Pass crate and apart from sort of looking through it the first time, I, I never go in there, you know. Um, so I, I, I did take the statuettes out and put them on a shelf. So, you know, those I do actually see every day. But, uh, you know, and, and you know, Paul's suitcase, I haven't been in there for Egypt Station for a very long time. I just listen to the music. And um, so for for this, which, you know, it's I'm, I'm sorry to say I have to sort of downgrade my collector status by not getting this one. Um, I just couldn't do it. Although I have to say also universal that if when I had clicked on that link, it said 1395 instead of 1695, I might have I might have done it. <laughs> that that extra $350 just seemed, you know, kicking it over $1,500 seemed to sort of be a, a limit for me. And, you know, by the time I saw it was really only $1,350, they were sold out. Hmm. So there we are. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to it. There's no doubt about it. Mind Games is my favorite Lennon album still. Mm -hmm. And... um you know, whenever you get these archival releases, it can bring a new appreciation. Absolutely. And I, you, we've certainly seen that with a lot of McCartney's releases, mm -hmm. uh, especially his early 70s stuff. But um, can't wait for us to talk about it. It's going to take a while to get to know all these different versions of the 12 songs. Right. And we're definitely going to have to get a, a Dolby Atmos review from from Alan on the Newtopian National Anthem, because that's the one thing that we're all looking forward to. You need as many speakers as possible in your that's room right. to, that's to appreciate that one. Um, and, and they really should give you a longer version of the song. But I am um, one thing we should talk about. Is, uh, is something that we talked about actually before we started recording the show was that I feel like uh, this is very poorly displayed. The big box set, the Uber box set, and the contents, which you're just going to assume anything and everything Mind Games is in the Uber box set. Fine. <clears throat> but then the next level down, you know, um, the website, we talked about this again, the website, um, it's a little confusing, I think, the way it's laid out when you're going for maybe some of the smaller configurations. The press release that went out went out to the press. I don't think it went out. I don't think the, the, the you know, general public is 
getting the press release laid out the way the way we have it. Uh, but in looking at John Lennon's website this morning, um, I was actually uh, a little uh, confused by the way it's described on the website, the contents of the box, what of those items are still in the smaller standard box sets. When I say items, I mean, there are the book or poster, you know, how is that all laid out? I don't think it's that clear on the website. What you're actually getting, should you go for the seven LP set or the six discs, you know, because you are getting some extra stuff. I mean, the way it's worded here on the website, my interpretation is that um, if you go to the official store to make your purchase uh, and scroll down past the super deluxe box set, which is now out, like I said, it's sold out. Um, the um, the Mind Games Ultimate Mixes two LP set is 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 has a has photos, and you're just assuming that's what you're getting in there, and that's a cube. A clear box? No, that's the cover of the Uber box. Why is it shown in the photograph on the website? So it's 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 a little confusing the way it's laid out. Another part of the uh, website refers to um, refers to uh, there being nine LPs, which in another part of the description is seven LPs. Yeah, I think it's seven. The other yeah, two we should maybe we, we we should say what's in the super deluxe box, which uh, which which is the the ultimate collection super deluxe box. I don't think they use the word Uber. I think that was from Harris. No, that's not- yeah. We do. Um, so you get the Yoko Ono Danger Box, nineteen sixty six, which is a limited edition artwork reproduction of the thirteen inch Perspex Cube. Okay. You get John Lennon, You Are Here, which is a limited edition canvas artwork reproduction, uh, 12-inch circular canvas of John's artwork, You Are Here. Uh, Mind Games. Mm -hmm. It's from the website? Yeah. Okay. Right. So Mind Games Ultimate Collection, which is basically the six CD, two Blu-ray box that I'm getting. Then the Mind Games Ultimate Collection 7 LP box, which I may get separately. <laughs> the Mind Games Meat City EP hologram vinyl. Okay. Um, so that's, you know, the vinyl single, but with hologram. Uh, Mind Games Magic Box, the ultimate mixes and outtakes on two LP color picture vinyl discs visually reimagined by Zoetrope. Okay. And then Maps, John Lennon's Liverpool and Yoko Ono's Tokyo. Then the 350-page book from Thames and Hudson and a Citizen of Newtopia box, which includes the Newtopian flag, the Newtopian embassy plaque, Declaration of Newtopia, and a whole bunch of Newtopia-related stuff. And then the I Ching box, uh, bespoke John and Yoko I Ching coins and poster. And then Mind Games Perspex word puzzle. And then a bespoke cardboard shipping container. So those are the... <laughs> Those are the extras. Um, if you absolutely want it and didn't get it, well, you know, I'm sure eBay, someone on eBay will be happy to charge you three, four thousand dollars for it. It sounds like, and I'm not totally sure, but the coffee table size book, which is supposed to be released separately right. in, in September, okay. that's part of this, the the deluxe. It looks that way. Yeah, yeah. it looks that way. Uh, but then elsewhere, now I'm looking at what you read, Alan, off uh, the the website. Um, elsewhere, if and I, it's 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 very hard to kind of describe how I'm navigating around here. Um, in another description, well, I took notes from another another another. Was it was that what you were reading? Uh, reading from. Um, 
the standard deluxe box set, which comes in the super deluxe box set. I'm guessing you're getting both. You're getting the vinyl and CD box sets essentially in the super deluxe, you're getting them both. Right. Okay. So, so in the uh, Mind Games Ultimate Collection standard deluxe box set, which I'm assuming is the one available individually and is in the, right. let's call it the, mm -hmm. you're getting six CDs, two Blu rays, and a 136 page hardback 10 inch book. Right. And I wrote here in my notes, 128 pages. I think that that was changed today, the number of pages there, because I have written down here 128 pages. It says 136 page book. Okay. Irregardless, more than 100 pages. Now, if you drop down to the next item that's inside the Uber box, it's the Ultimate Collection, the 7 LP box. All right. So this is the LP version of the CD box. That's what I'm thinking. You look through the description and it seems as though that the LP box is giving you more different stuff than you're getting in the CD box set. The CD set, six CDs, two Blu-rays, hardback book, poster postcards, Newtopian Citizen ID card, period. Seven LP box set, you're getting four gatefold LPs. They describe each disc as give the name. Outtakes, raw studio mixes, eight page booklet, inner sleeves, two posters, two postcards. That's different contents to me. Hmm. Between LP box set, CD box set. Well, in terms of the tracks, it says LPs track seven contain the same track listings as the CDs. So, so if you buy the CDs or buy the vinyl, you're getting different extras. It looks like. Okay. And if you buy the Uber box, like I did, if you bought it, because it's gone now, you're getting both box sets plus uh, Separate wine book. glasses and nunchucks and all kinds of other things uh, added in there. That was a joke. You don't get nunchucks. Um, but I, when I saw a flag, I think the flag is just like probably, I, I think the flag was uh, like a, a handkerchief or something. Uh, but um, it's just, like, what is a Perspex word puzzle? I mean, I'm looking forward to getting this. I'm glad I got it. Again, I, I have issues with, with the amount of money and the size and the scope of these, these, these packages. And I'm frightened for what might come when it's walls and bridges time. Um, may even have a bridge in there. Um, I'm excited. And then on the other side of the coin, I'm like, wow, I don't know. I don't know. Um, reminds me of that skit. I think it came out of um, uh, Fred Armisen's part of it. And I think it might have come from out of uh, his show Portlandia, uh, where they get the, uh, uh, the uh, B50, they get a B-50 juice box set. And 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 the uh, and, and Fred Armisen and his friend are like, wow, this is the complete B fifty twos box set, and they're going through all the contents. You know, it comes with a comb. You know, and it has hair, the blonde hair, and the comb. And at the bottom is the band. You get the band. Little miniature B fifty two members are in each box set, and they come out and they say hi to you. You know, it's a little house they're living in that's in the box set. Uh, and it's really actually hit the nail on the head with the with uh, the size and scope of these things. The little miniature Sean, Sean Lennon and Yoko Ono will pop out of a uh, pop out of the box. Fred Armisen is having an influence on these box sets that were. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they gave a, I, one of them is like you get a demo or or a, a live recording on cassette only that's in that box set. And they put it on, they're listening to it, and it's like a wall of noise. You can't make out what the performance is that's on the cassette. They were listening to it going, wow. <laughs> you know, speaking of that, just looking at the CD6 <laughs> outtakes, um, they're studio outtakes, but there are no demos for these songs. And 
there probably ought to be, you know, there, there could easily be a, a, an interesting CD of demos. I mean, starting with mind games, which used to be a totally different song, make love, not war. Um, why not include uh, some demos as well? That's well, maybe that will be part of the evolutionary mixes. Oh, possibly. Maybe. Yeah. 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 They don't really, um, they They're don't supposed to be like what goes into those. You have to, we'll have to wait to hear them. Yeah. I huh. can't wait till we do the show where we actually dissect each disc because I can see right now elemental mixes, elements mixes, evolution documentary. I am already confused. I don't know what I'm listening to. Um, the music, I sh I'm sure, regardless of what mix it's and what they call it, is going to be outstanding. But Still, you've got the outtakes on one disc, the raw studio mixes. And again, here, the evolution documentary, the elements mixes, the elemental mixes. Well, I'm very glad they gave us the elemental mixes on one disc and the elements mixes on another. And we won't ever get those confused now. Mm. <laughs> I need Tylenol after that. I mean, there is. I haven't had a chance to, to listen, but on YouTube, they do have the the evolutionary documentary uh, um, audio for just mind games. If you want to, yeah. this it's early, cool. it's cool. Yeah, so and I it, it starts the, with the piano demo of of Make Love Not War, and then it evolves. Right. I saw that, you know, and that is a bit of that film that Tony Cox took over um, three or four days. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but in the um, 90s, early 90s, there were these couple of guys from Boston who had bought all of this footage from Tony Cox and wanted to put out a documentary. And it includes, you know, that Make Love Not War, him working on that stuff, um, the uh, top of the pop session for Instant Karma. Uh, really, lots of interesting stuff uh, in this in this in this bunch of film, and um, it was ultimately stopped. Uh, you know, they didn't really have the rights to it. Although I believe Tony Cox sold it to them as if they would have the rights to it, and then uh, Yoko's lawyer uh, stepped in and said, "No, no, you really don't." Um, I remember seeing that footage. Uh, at the time and writing a piece about it for it for the times about it. Um, and I talked to Yoko's lawyer then, and he said, no, they're not going to be able to put that out. Um, but it's interesting that, that Yoko is including a bit of that footage in the promo for the, for the box set, because it's, it really is fascinating stuff. I, I, I really wish it could come out. It's like, like I think three days worth of filming, where Tony Cox just followed them around with an early video camera uh, and and caught a lot of stuff, um, including uh, they're, they're driving into London um, to, I can't remember what they're going to do. I think they're going to look at, uh, John is going to look at the Some Other Guy cavern footage. Um, and they get out of the car and who do they run into on the street but Brian Somerville, who was very early PR guy for he was the PR guy for the first tour or the first American tour. You you see him when they're at, at the Pan Am building in, in that press conference, you see Brian Somerville off to the side. He's a very tall, bald guy. Um, so it's funny, you know, John just runs into him on the street and then you see John uh, watching the Some Other Guy film. And, uh, you know, really tons of interesting stuff in that. I I, I, I wish Yoko would have a, a change of heart and put that out herself. Hmm. You never know what could happen. Hmm. So we'll see. Can we just clear up one thing? It's, it's my understanding the two Blu-rays for Mind Games includes everything that's on the six discs, the, C, the six CDs, Plus Dolby mixes, right? Looks like it. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay, Dolby mixes and the my and the Mind Games music video and uh, you are here. Additional outtake tape boxes and music video. Uh, I guess I guess it's a music video they made for you are here with an outtake, 
and the video is the tape box is from the sessions. Okay. They should have given us a, a, an EP of the little spoken gibberish bit that's in Meat City. Mm. Well, there's supposed to be two different versions of Meat City and what's said like that. Yeah, there are. The yeah. single. Yeah. The B-side uh, that it was on the B side of the mind game sig single, right? The voice, I says something, and the voice is an, an engineer, the engineer or someone, um, that was working the session with John. He says something like, "Check the album," and it's sped up, and that's what plays when you have on the forty five. You buy the mind games album, Meet City. That voice is now saying, "F a duck, a pig." F, F a pig. Um, so, but I thought it'd be a funny EP if they did that in different speeds. There had to be outtakes from the F a pig session. <laughs> <laughs> they could call it the F a, F a pig Zoe Trope picture disc. There you go. <laughs> Little, never mind. So, uh, I'm looking forward to getting my box in July. Um, and at the same time, I'm terrified of the credit card statement. But but that's what that's that's what you know that's my life music Beatles, um. So what else is there? Exactly. There's always the there's always the New York Mets. I knew it. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. We really should do our own podcast on the Mets. <laughs> Actually, I've been a Met fan longer than you have. You have. Yes, I have. Well, you will, I'm sure, remember the 69 champions. That's where it all started for me. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't have no memory of that whatsoever. My first memory is going to a doubleheader in either 1971 or 72 at Shea. And I can still remember my father trying to show me by looking at the scoreboard when the games ended because I was probably looking to leave. Uh, and he was showing the little red dot that marks the innings. You know, and uh, the one through nine. And then, well, why do they stop at nine and not go to zero? Well, that's 10. Well, why don't we go to 10? I vaguely remember that conversation. It was probably a shut up and watch the game after that then. Uh, and 73. I mean, 73 postseason. I have memories of. But anyway. Uh, that's just a teaser for our future podcast. Yes. Okay. And, and we're going to have Alan there as the Yankee. The uh, anti Met fan, Yankee fan. But uh, we had one other fun thing to happen this week, right? It was time to move on to our. Yes. We'll talk about Ringo's QA. Um, as we're recording this on May the 17th, this was two days ago on the 15th. It was strictly on Zoom. And uh, a lot of media people were invited to it. And we were all asked to submit questions that uh, Ringo could possibly uh, consider. And one of my questions, I sent four of them in. One of them, uh, Ringo answered. But um, basically, it was what you would kind of expect in most Ringo interviews, which is talk about the new EP, Crooked Crooked Boy, working with Linda Perry, uh, the next project, which, which is his country album, uh, talking about uh, his friendship with Paul McCartney these days and what he's doing with him and um, you know, also uh, how he feels about AI. Uh, he talked a little bit about Let It Be, the the new uh, remastered version, and um, and that was uh, I was surprised it went on for fifty minutes because a lot of interviews that that Ringo does is fairly short. Yeah. But, um, you know the the one question that that um, he answered of mine was. Were you familiar with Linda Perry's work with Four Nine Blondes prior to working with her? Um, and there are two songs Linda Perry gave to Ringo before the Crooked Boy EP. And um, he said that he knew that she was a writer and has great spirit. And she's a serious songwriter. She's great to hang out with and a great musician. Didn't really elaborate about Four Nine Blondes. Um, he did kind of say that somebody suggested that he work with her. And also Linda Perry 
flat out asked him, how about if I produced and wrote for your next EP? And he said yes. Which is kind of interesting in a way because um, I hang out with a lot of Todd Rundgren fans <laughs> and I've met Todd a few times. And one uh, person asked him uh, why he doesn't write more with Ringo. This was at a time when he was touring all the time with Ringo. And, and Todd said, well, you kind of learn with certain people that you wait till they ask you. You don't ask them. That certainly wasn't the case with Linda Perry because she just went and asked him. <laughs> and Ringo said yes. I kind of wish Todd did more more songwriting with, with Ringo. There's only one song, Postcards from Paradise. But, um, you know, one of the, the important things that Ringo seems to bring out in all the interviews that he does is that most of the things that he does in his life now is not planned. You know, he just goes with the flow. And if somebody makes a suggestion to him and he likes it, he goes with it. Linda Perry asked him, can I produce an EP for you? He said, yes. He ran into T-Bone Burnett when he was at a um, an event with Olivia Harrison where she was reading the, the right. new poems that she had written over the years since George's passing. And she put out a book of those poems. And Ringo uh, saw T-Bone Burnett there and T-Bone suggested uh you know working with Ringo and Ringo said do you have any songs for me and that resulted in one song a country song and that led to making a whole country album which he's working on now so it's not like it's something that's in the back of his mind oh I'm going to do a country album next things kind of fall into place in a way so it's going to be interesting to hear that because um T-Bone Burnett is is um uh, is, is a brilliant musical mind he put out an album it's been a while since he had an album of his own music out, but he put one out earlier this year, which unfortunately I haven't heard anything from. But uh, one thing, though, is T-Bone's got a very distinctive sound as a producer. And um, knowing, like, um, I mean, listen to, I don't know about the second one, but listen to the first Robert Plant and Alison Krauss collaboration. That's a T-Bone Burnett. Uh, also, Robert Plant's solo album, Band of Joy. Not Band of Joy. Uh, there's another one that T-Bone produced. I'm getting all mixed up now. But regardless, T-Bone's got a very unique sound as a producer. And I'm just curious how that's going to... That could make a, for a wonderful, different Ringo album. Unlike even Cuckoo's of Blues. Um, um, so, and, and, and he's calling a country... It's going to probably, I'm assuming it's going to be, yeah, it's country, but there's so many subgenres of every style of music. But if you, you think about the music uh, and the vibe of the music in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, that film, um, that could be what we're in for uh, with this, this new Ringo album. It's going to be really interesting, especially coming after Crooked Boy, which did tend to be a little more aggressive you know, Linda, uh, Linda Perry style as a writer, you know, a little different from what Ringo would normally do. Not light years different, but uh, Ringo did also talk about that he would make suggestions into the content of the lyrics. If someone were writing a song for him and they're handling the lyrics for him, he wanted there to always be a degree of positivity in what the lyrics have. Um and that was something I think Linda Perry asked him mm -hmm. content wise here. Is there something you're looking for? And he didn't say directly peace and love, but he, that, that positivity that he wants per, likes to be in the words. And that, you know, was what Linda Perry w ran with uh, when doing these songs. He said that um, the song could be a downer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. sum up. That's how he put it. And, um, yeah, I think that he said that he wanted a rock song from Linda, which is how mm -hmm. Gonna Need Someone came about, mm -hmm. uh, which really a lot of people love that, love the four yeah. songs. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I would love to I, actually what I should, I didn't, I didn't submit a question. I forgot, uh, to the press conference. 
but I'd like to know more about the photo on the cover of Crooked Boy, where that was taken. We wasn't that from uh, 64 when the Beatles were in Florida? Swim it looks like it is. Yeah. But why that shot? Why Crooked Boy, the title? And what was it? Was there any you kind of message or any method to the madness? Or was it just kind of random? Just well, that was Ringo was at the Amoeba record store with Linda Perry. They talked a little bit about that because Linda found the photo. I don't know how she got the photo, but she thought this is a great photo of Ringo. It should make the front cover. You know, um, I don't know much more than that, but she did pick the photo that's on mm. there. Okay. Ringo went with it. Um, Ringo also said that he changed one lyric in the song Crooked Boy. Um, he said as far as the country album um, that he actually plays bongo. <laughs> the bongos on on one of the records um he didn't give too much detail about it but um he mentioned that gary burr contributed a song which we know about because gary told us that mm -hmm. and um gary had said that it's a much more traditional sounding country album it's not a very slick modern produced yeah. country that's gonna it's gonna be more like in that style and i think a lot of people would a lot of his fans would kind of favor that maybe closer in sound to Bukuza blues, which he did talk about. See, Just I don't, I don't think it will. I think it's going to be different. Bukus to me sounds like a classic uh, country album that um, I don't know, someone like Owen Bradley might've produced for Patsy Klein or something like that from the early sixties, a really, really hardcore Nashville sounding country album of its time. Like I said, T-Bone Burnett's got this very unique sound, very organic. Uh, I don't mean this to be um, to be negative or, or, or to poke fun, uh, but I've always said that T-Bone Burnett's, like his drum sound that he comes up with, the drums sound like the drummer is playing uh, wet pillows with a, with, with, a, with a mallet. I mean, it's a very distinct uh, sound that's what I expect maybe I'm going to be wrong maybe it's going to be old school 60s Nashville the one thing that I, I, I kind of wish Ringo would have elaborated on is that you know he has said that the reason why he started doing EPs was because of COVID because you couldn't get a lot of musicians together in the same room so people would send him files and he would play to them he'd play the drums and add his vocals he said that about the song that paul mccartney wrote for him on the last ep before this you know and that's pretty much how the linda perry ep was done she got her band of musicians together they did the backing tracks ringo added his drums and added his vocals if, if ringo wanted to make any more changes he would do it but it's not the same thing as being in the studio with a whole bunch of musicians and working on songs from scratch and, you know, just having the songs develop and having the chemistry there in the studio instead of here, here's all the tracks, just add to it. Mm -hmm. you know, and I wanted to know how he felt about that. It, it's the same level of excitement. And um, I'm sure there are still times when he's in his own studio at home and Steve Lukather pops by and adds a guitar track or something. But as far as all the musicians together, you know, like it used to be on his albums, this is a whole different approach mm -hmm. tracks and just, you know, overdubbing drums and, and his vocals. So I'd like to know if he wants to at any time in the near future, go back to the old method of doing it. Cause it still sounds great. The Linda Perry EP sounds really good production wise. I love it. Um, remember, remember me saying the last show that I had some issues about it. Yeah several listens and a lot of that kind of went away <laughs> you know, i don't quite hear what i kind of heard initially you know i'm a little more uh i'm, I'm enjoying it a bit more now uh, well, which i thought would happen you know i i've said quite often that i never like giving reviews very quickly after a release. yeah true yeah you know you got it takes a while to know an album and even this in this case even though it's only four songs 
you know, you might not like a song initially and after five listens, oh, it's a lot better than I thought. You know, so you got to give music time to breathe, time to absorb it all. And so I, I like to, I prefer to wait a while before I give a review. It's going right. to take quite a while to get to know all the different versions of buying games. <laughs> you know, just like Plastic Auto Band was the, was one of the toughest to review because it's so difficult to tell one version from another. But uh, I'm that should be a future show for us. Hmm. Like one of us is the designated uh, DJ, and the other two, I'll play you, and uh, I'll play you, uh, uh, and what are they? What are they called here? I already forgot. I'll play you an element mix of only people, and ask you which one is this? Which mix is this? Elements or evolution? Elements. Ev eh, wrong. <laughs> Minus ten for Cozen. Michaels, the board is yours. Okay. Well, I'll probably get some of them, but not all of them, especially if they're real close in, in arrangements and all. All right. So we covered a lot of territory here, and uh, this has been fantastic. Why don't we go around the horn here and tell the folks what we're up to? Darren? I'm up to here. That's what I'm <laughs> Um. Uh, at WFUV, you could listen. Uh, I'm on the air five days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. Uh, and then Saturday afternoons from one until four. Uh, they let they let the nighttime creature out in the day on Saturdays. So WFUV is in New York City at 90.7 FM. Um, you could listen on our website, so you can listen anywhere at wfuv.org and we have an app too and um and look for me on my two facebook pages uh darren devivo the other one is darren devivo wfuv dj and beetle podcaster i believe is the name of it uh but join me at one of them and i'll invite you to the other even though it's sort of redundant and uh one more reminder that uh, uh, uh things we said today has a brand new facebook page um and it's things we said today. Video podcast. Video podcast. I only started. I don't remember what it's called. <laughs> uh, and I ask that you join us there. And if you're on our old page, which has sort of a caveat on the top about this being an old page that's going to get shut down, please join us on the new one because the old one is at some point going to get shut down. We're going to end up cutting off a lot of people. But... Uh, you but don't anyway. want to be left out. Yeah, you don't want to be left out. Uh, so that's my that's my story. Okay, Alan. Okay, well, what I'm up to at the <clears throat> moment is um, getting ready for volume three of McCartney Legacy. <clears throat> and my bit of it at the moment is I, I have actually in this room almost every issue of Rolling Stone and I'm going through and making searchable scans of all of the McCartney and Beatles related articles and random notes and everything that they've had, uh, and, you know, plus other things that just seem interesting to me. Like I did a Dylan interview yesterday, you know, from 1984, uh, I'll, revisit that at some point soon. And as you know, sometimes it's, it's interesting to have non Beatles things as well for context. I've got various things about, you know, state of the record industry and stuff like that. So um, getting the archive together for volume three, which will be the eighties uh, after Rolling Stone, I'm going to go through all the Beatle fans and then all the Beatles monthlies, those uh, wraparound new sections that Mark Lewison used to actually write most of, I think, um, or I think he, he started at a certain point, the, the ones before it, he didn't do, but, uh, you know, those will give us a lot of, you know, what Paul is up to at the minute, you know, kind of things. So, uh, yeah, getting that stuff together and, um, it's fun, interesting work. And anyway, you can get in contact with, oh, oh, one thing. Um, while I was going through this, I found uh, a Westwood One ad for a 1982 
interview that McCartney was doing as a, as a Westwood One show when Tug of War came out. And it was broadcast, according to the ad, uh, in July 1982. Somehow I didn't get it, uh, you know, and I was paying attention to things in those days and taping anything that was on the radio related to the Beatles, and it somehow isn't in my collection. Uh, and I've written to lots of friends who behave similarly, and it seems not to be in their collections either. So if anybody has the 1982, summer 1982, Westwood One interview that Paul did about Tug of War, I'd love a copy. Um, so get in touch with me at, uh, well, lots of different ways. You can get in touch with me on Facebook, just under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed two different Facebook pages. You can write to all of us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at things we said fab and our multiplicity of Facebook pages, most of which you should ignore except for things we said today, video podcast. Look at that one. That one will have all the, information you need. Uh, the shows are posted there and, uh, you know, there you are. And also look for us on YouTube, subscribe to our page, subscribe to us on Podbean or on Apple podcasts, any place you want. Uh, we're everywhere. So I think that's it for me. You're inspiring me to look through my uh, vinyl collection because when I worked at WDHA in New Jersey, I know there was a McCartney interview that we aired, but I think it was for Pipes of Peace. Mm -hmm. So I will find out for you. Great. I will check it out. Okay. As for me, if you ever want to get in touch with me directly, just me, um, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. You can also friend me on Facebook at Ken Michaels. If you want to check out my radio program on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, the easiest way to do so is to go to the website of WFDU in New Jersey. That's Fairleigh Dickinson University's website and click on their archival pages, type in Every Little Thing. They run the show every week and they then post each show available for two weeks. So um, you could either listen to the show live at the radio station or the easiest way is just to go to their website and, and stream it on demand wfdu.fm my other uh talk show podcast talk more talk a solo beatles video cast which i do with kiddo tool tom hunyadi and joe mayo we just had ken womack on the show and we talked about the newly restored let it be you might want to check that out our next show normally would be on May the 27th, but that happens to be Memorial Day. So we might be taking that week off. So our next show should be the following Monday. Okay. Um, and that also concerns us because I don't know when our next show will be. Could be next week. Not sure if we're going to do anything around Memorial Day. But uh, on my own YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio, just today, before recording this, I did an interview with Daryl Easley. He is the editor of Record Collector. And back in January, they put out this all McCartney issue, all about his solo career, reviews of every single solo album, special um, articles on, uh, say, Paul as a musician, Paul writing songs for children. Uh, Mickey Dolenz contributed an article of his experience of meeting the Beatles in 1967. Uh, Mike McCartney contributed an article. Uh, and submitted some of his own photos. And we did an entire show on Ken Michaels Radio talking about this new issue and uh, Daryl's own feelings about Paul's solo career. That's going to be probably on my channel by the time you see this at Ken Michaels Radio. I also did an interview with Jeff Slate. Jeff is a friend of ours who uh, is a New York musician and a rock journalist. You might even recall that when the Sgt. Pepper box set came out, he wrote an article that appeared in the booklet for Sgt. Pepper. He writes his own material. He's recorded with lots of great musicians, including members of Wings, Lawrence Juber and Steve Holly, uh, also Adam Ippolito and Gary Van Sayak of Elephant's Memory. 
And he's just released a brand new album today, as a matter of fact, May 17th, called The Last Day of Summer. We talk about that. But we also do a number nine dream show on John Lennon. And if you're not familiar with a number nine dream show, uh, that's when I ask a guest to pick a Beatle to talk about. And I come up with three categories on that Beatle. And my guest has to come up with their top three choices in each category. Like in the case of this show with Jeff Slate, top three vocals of John of all time. <clears throat> top three song lyrics from John of all time. And top three solo Lennon album cuts, meaning non-hits of all time. So Jeff gives you three of each. That means nine answers. And that's how you get a number nine dream. And that's on my uh, YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. So we've got Daryl Easley and Jeff Slate, my newest interviews right there at Ken Michaels Radio. Please subscribe to that channel. Please subscribe to Talk More Talk. If you haven't subscribed to things we said today, what's keeping you? Hit that subscribe button. That would mean a lot to all of us. And um, I think that's it. Of course, there's my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, where you'll find Beatles trivia uh, every two weeks at the moment with lots of great prizes to give away, including the McCartney Legacy, Volume 1. Even though Alan's already ahead of the game working on Volume 3, I still got Volume 1 here. You could still win it. The ultimate McCartney book, biographical on Paul McCartney, series of books. So... This has been great talking about the news, mind games, let it be. Ringo. Q&A. So thanks to all of you for joining us. And for Alan and Darren, I'm Ken Michaels. And we'll see you next time. Take care.